All right. Hello, everyone. I'm joined today again with Chris Ferguson. This is part five of my Gamergate book interview with him. How are you doing today, Chris? Doing, doing good. A little sleepy. I, I went to uh, Hong Kong a couple weeks ago, and uh, ever since I've, I've come back, I, my sleep schedule's still a little bit off. So, yeah. Uh, st still has an like, afternoon period where I probably go to bed at like two. <laughs> I just go to bed. Uh, for like eight hours if I wanted to, so yeah, a little tricky. Hong Kong, dang, what'd you do there? I actually taught a class um, in uh, meta-analysis, which is about as interesting as it sounds, but uh, uh, no, it was good. It was a good opportunity to get out there and see Hong Kong. So I've never been to any part of China before, so that was pretty neat. Did you know that there were Gamergate meetups in China? No. I, I, well, in I, Hong I, Kong I, specifically. I don't know about mainland China. Okay, yeah, yeah no, I didn't know that, no. All right. Well, hey, we're in the politics section, so this ought to be interesting. Okay. Some I have no people, politics. <laughs> some people have argued that Gamergate was mostly or entirely right wing. Do you think that was accurate? Well, no. I mean, that's, that's obviously not what you know the data we have suggests um, at this point. Um, you know, we talked about you know probably on the first day uh, months ago at this point, uh, the uh, evidence suggests that. Politically, you know, probably pretty all over the place, but the, yeah, they tend to lean a little bit more liberal, if anything, compared to the general public. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's no, no evidence that it's a right-wing phenomenon, necessarily. Yeah, I'm still waiting on one person to send me their data for the pro-Gamergate side from my optional survey. Um, but it looks like it's about one-third going for Biden, one-third going for Trump, and 40% who are... A mix of either undecided or not voting uh, out of the American Gamergate supporters for this coming election. So, yeah. that's a huge, huge amount of undecided. undecided. I mean, I think that's yeah. much larger than. Well, so yeah, I, I say I undecided. I think it's like I'm combining several things um, yeah, yeah. to make it easier for presentation. But like in the actual data set, it'll show like how many are undecided versus how many are third party, like libertarian yeah, yeah. or green, um, and then how many of them are. Um, not going to vote, which I think was only like one person, I recall, if I recall. Yeah. But, but as your data showed, only only 55% of the Gamergate people even live in the United States. So, mm -hmm. Now, do you... Uh, oh, so, obviously, people have made a lot of claims about the politics of Gamergate supporters. Um, Asia Romano of Vox, for instance, she's mm -hmm. written extensively about Gamergate, but uh, only ever includes one perspective, it seems. She she posits that Gamergate is linked to Donald Trump being elected in 2016, uh, and she also links because Trump was elected by Gamergate supposedly, uh, and he launched the attack on the Capitol on January 6th. Therefore, Gamergate is de facto responsible for January 6th. Um, do you have any thoughts on this supposed connection between Gamergate and one Trump's election, and two, I guess uh, January 6th specifically? Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly seen that claim. It's, it's a very Twitterish claim for uh, you know people to make, um, and I'm not really. I mean, obviously, it's sort of the, 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 almost conspiracy-like theory. The idea that like everything ties together. That you know, because of the grassy knoll, and, you know, in the 1960s, and you know, the CIA and blah blah blah. All these things kind of connect. There's like this massive you know plot that's been going on, and. and uh, you know, people, people have, have this, this sort of the secret wisdom, wisdom and if only everybody else could see that it all began with, you know, this one thing, you know, that everything ties together, it's all this big right-wing conspiracy, um, you know, I think it's kind of a tempting idea for people on, you know, one political side to view everything that they don't like being interrelated and, you know, that they, uh, you know, are the crusaders against all these things, and again, like, only the general public fully understood, then, you know, history can be very, very different, but, you know, I, I don't know why they think that the average Trump vi uh, voter loves video games. <laughs> you know, if anything, Trump was pretty hostile, you know, to video games uh, for, you know, a while, so I don't, I don't know why they're going to draw that connection between, you know, the, 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 what happened with gaming games. So I guess, okay, well... well I don't think the Trump claim, I don't think there's any validity to that. I don't think Gamergate caused Trump to get elected. I think it's stupid. Um, but there is also this other idea, too. Um, this is one that has maybe a little bit more support behind it um, in terms of people who believe it, I guess, um, than the Trump thing. And that is the 
Gamergate to alt-right pipeline idea. Some of the people I've interviewed who are on the anti-Gamergate side, they believe this is accurate, or, or if not 100% accurate, there's some truth in it. Uh, that that Gamergate essentially um, was a precursor to or led people or funneled people in some capacity towards becoming far right. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I don't, I, I don't, I've never <laughs> seen any particular data to, to, to support, support that. I'd love to see some sort of actual um, empirical analysis that, that suggests that that was true. I mean, again, given that the average person that was involved in Gamergate was not anywhere close to the you know, far right in terms of the political views, um, that would be a pretty remarkable turnaround, uh, you know, in terms of their attitudes towards politics, you know, generally. So uh, I, I think it's just you know, two different things they don't like, and so they try to draw a connection between those two different things they don't like, and there's not much evidence that suggests that the election of Trump in 2016 would have been, you know, any different, you know, if only Gamergate had not happened, or people had taken it more seriously, or, or whatever the narrative happens to be. Uh, that, that people are in, uh, indulging. I mean, you know, my, my sense of, you know, of uh, the Trump election in 2016 is it was driven a lot, you know, by older adults and, you know, by uh, poorer people and, you know, that kind of, and there's a whole bunch of analysis of the demographics of, of, of Trump, you know, but like gamers, you know, what didn't really sort of leap out at me is, is the, the core demographic of, of, of Trump voters. You know? So I, I think I think that connection is pretty tenuous. And I, I've never seen any data, political or psychological, to support it. No. Yeah, I agree. There's not any data to support it necessarily. Uh, but I, anecdotally, like if you want to use like, uh, I don't think that I don't think the data bears that out. Um, that the Gamergate people were far right or that they in mass went to the far right. There are some individual cases, though, where people did become more radical or more right wing or even more like extreme left, too, because of the Gamergate stuff specifically. It's, or not, not because of the Gamergate stuff specifically, but they were supporters of Gamergate and they were mm -hmm. also far right or mm -hmm. far left. And they did become radicalized. Some, people, some of them were like far right before and they tried to grift yeah, off yeah. of it, right? Uh, yeah, like Box Day tried to grift off the Gamergate stuff, for instance, and others. Uh, but then you also had like people like Sargon, for instance, right, who didn't start out far right, but right. later became that. Um, so, do you think there's like any truth to that, or is it just that these people probably would have ended up there anyway? Yeah, yeah I, mean, I, I mean, I think most likely like that is, is, is the case. I mean, you know, you know that's, that's always the trouble with anecdotes, right? Is you can like sit around and try to find the specific cases that fit your story. You can always find some someone or something. Yeah, some, some anecdote, anecdote somewhere that this whatever narrative you know you want to you know you want to fit. I mean, you can kind of look at like you know, Disney movies. You know, some of these guys that you know January six, you know, were big fans of you know Moana. You know, what more do I need to say? You know that uh, you know all all of these you know Frozen fans at, at, at January six. You know. Uh, what are the odds, you know, kind of thing, you know, well, I don't know, that's pretty high, probably, you know, so that's always the trouble with anecdotes, so people kind of look around, you know, for the anecdotes that support their, you know, their narrative, and uh, they'll ignore any of the people involved in Gamergate who went on to become, you know, Elizabeth Warren fans, or something of that sort, you know, uh, they probably exist too, you know, but that doesn't fit the narrative, so that people are, are ignored. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's why I'm going to be careful. Well, a lot yeah, of them were Bernie yeah. fans. Um, yeah, there you yeah, go. Some of them might be Well, the Bernie fans were kind of controversial, too, right? The Bernie Bros. I remember all that kind of oh, stuff. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so let's push back here. I don't, you know, I don't think there's a lot of data on this Gamergate to far right idea. But uh, Nancy Pelosi's attacker, David DePape, uh, he says that. Uh, one of the things that put him down a path towards radicalization was uh, Gamergate. Now, I don't think he was involved in Gamergate like as a supporter, like, a, like in the movement or anything. Um, there doesn't seem to be evidence of that. But it does look like he did watch some videos criticizing Anita Sarkeesian. And that those videos uh, put him, according to him at least, in an algorithm on YouTube that led him to see more conservative ideas. And that led him to eventually attacking Pelosi. He also supposedly posted on the Social Justice in Action subreddit, which I was a moderator of, um, and didn't like the Social Justice Warriors very much. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm still, still not, not like, like, 
<laughs> yeah. The thing about like criminal offenders, right? Sometimes they look for you know anything to blame it as themselves. So you kind of see that narrative, you know, over and over again. We had, uh, uh, you know, what was it? Uh, what was the guy's name that um, killed? Uh, See well, I mean, yeah, yeah, Charles, yeah, Charles, Charles Manson, who, you know, blamed the Beatles, but you also had, I can't think of the guy's name, the guy that killed John Lennon, who thought he was acting out Catcher in the Rye, right? You know, so you always find these kind of stories of, of uh, individuals who, in many ways, may be legitimately disturbed, um, you know, and sort of latch onto one thing or another that they claim is, you know, inspiring them towards... Well, he didn't say it inspired him to do the attack. He just says that that was, like, his first exposure with conservative ideas. Mm-hmm. Or, like, or the algorithm wanted to promote him down that rabbit hole uh, after he watched okay. the Sarkeesian videos. Yeah, he I says. Uh, yeah, I'm not. <laughs> I, I've, I've heard these stories, stories you know, from offenders quite, quite a bit. bit. You know, yeah, like, you know, yeah, I, I got exposed to this, this and therefore you know, I, I became, uh, you know, a murderer for whatever reason or another. You know, but of course, the number one thing, you know. People will refer to our religious texts, you know. So if we're going to get upset about that, then the Bible, the Quran, or you know, other other religious texts are usually the main thing that you know individuals with psychosis or other mental disturbances will refer back to. You know, God told me to kill people. You know, it says so right in the you know whatever religious text they happen to be obsessed with. So uh, I think that's why we have to be a little bit careful, you know, that about you know, these types of, of claims because eventually. You know, I say, well, aha, you know, this thing that I don't like, you know, see, this murderer said that he got inspired by this thing I don't like, you know. But I'm actually going to find a murderer who can claim to be inspired by the thing To be clear, he's, he's, he's not a murderer, he's just an assaulter, I guess. No, it's true, true, fair enough. He, he, he tried his best, but no. All right, so, um, so in your estimation, if you had to put, like, a through line, or is there a through line with the Gamergate people in politics? Just like really briefly, like what if you had to surmise the politics of Gamergate? Uh, one, could you do it? And two, what would that summation be, real quick? Yeah, I don't quite see a real through line between Gamergate and anything else other than Gamergate. I mean, sometimes you know, sometimes things just happen in isolation, and you know, trying to connect the dots, you know, too hard becomes kind of like a conspiracy theory, you know, to, to some extent. So I think it was just. Yeah, the simple, sometimes the simplest explanation, you know, is the easiest one, which is a bunch of people, um, you know, who like the video games, uh, were annoyed by game journalism and, and the direction it was taken, and then were kind of loud about it, you know. And sometimes it's okay to say that's all that happened, <laughs> you know, they had no wider connection to, you know, uh, Donald Trump, you know, American politics, world events, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, you know, the Gaza-Israeli conflict, uh, whether Santa's going to bring us enough presents this year, you know, the price of oil, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes events can happen in isolation. You know, I think it's okay. And they don't have to be good events. We can we cannot like them. We cannot like the people involved, whatever. But sometimes it's just, you know, it's just something. And, uh, uh, and I think that's the case for Gamergate. It was just something, something, you know, and you can support one side, side support the other side, but it's not the linchpin of everything that happened since 2014. You know, it's just it's an isolated event. That's it. Do you not think that Gamergate has any, any impact in the political realm? Uh, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's a major event, no. I mean, you know, to say, it has, you know, uh, no impact. I mean, you start getting into what is it like the butterfly theory, right? You know, like that idea that everything in you know, has a small impact and everything else. You know, uh, it's chaos theory, right? You know, essentially, that you know, the, the, the butterfly flaps its wing and then a volcano erupts halfway across the world. You know, kind of thing. Um, yeah, I'm sure there's always you know, some minor connection between you know almost little anything, but very very minor. Yeah, I don't think it's you know. If, if, if you wave a magic history wand and make Gamergate go away, would the world today look much different than it does? No, I don't think so. Um, you know, Ru- Russia would still be halfway through Ukraine. You know, the uh, Palestinians and Israelis would still you know be at each other's throats. We still have you know Donald Trump trying to get back into the presidency. Uh, all the COVID still would have happened. All these other things would still have happened. Yeah, Gamergate just is the, the, the legend. Of Gamergate. Of all that's occurred in the last 10 years. Yeah, I I do agree. Though, you may be speaking too soon, Chris. 
If it weren't for mm-hmm. Gamergate, I probably wouldn't have become a political live streamer. If I didn't become a political live streamer, there you go. I'm not going to change the world. And uh, so if you walk it to the top, you know, then uh, well, I mean, it's, 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 it's the little things like that. I mean, yeah, I wouldn't have gotten into games research myself if it hadn't been for people trying to make me claim about games back in the late nineties, early two thousand. So. You know, you know, but, but you know, is that, that again? Yeah. It, 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 that, that itself is not a uh, you know a, a critical a moment in history. history. Yeah. Only Ferguson had stayed, you know, doing, doing clinical uh, forensic, forensic research. research you know, the life would have been so much different, different for the average person. person. No, 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 that's, no, that's, that's not, not the case. You know, um, I think again, the world will still be very, very similar. But but I don't. But if you if you use his book and this podcast to launch your presidential campaign and uh, become, become president of the United States, States. then we have to revisit this, right, and say, well, well we, we have our first, you know, uh, Gamergate uh, president, and uh, that, that maybe wouldn't, wouldn't have happened if, uh, you know, uh, if only not for Anita Sarkeesian. Well, I didn't get involved because Anita Sarkeesian, so, but, yes. Especially if you then, like, fix, like, the Palestinian-Israeli crisis or nuke China or something like that. That would be really sad. Gamergate was the beginning point. Oh, this is that good. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll circle back in 20 years yeah yeah, yeah. we'll see how it turns out <laughs> do you want to talk about your political views and philosophy oh I'm oh, just I'm tired, tired of politics, politics. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to my, my political views is, is I want to retire uh, get off of you know quit all newspapers and just disconnect entirely from the world uh, play, uh, play Dungeons, Dungeons and Dragons Dragon video games, and, 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 and uh, you know that, that's, that's it. it. I want to. I want to remember like when we were like, like I don't know, like seven, seven. You know, <laughs> and like we had no <laughs> idea. Maybe, maybe we knew there was such a thing as a president, um, but the president just kind of like magically showed up and was in charge. It seemed like a cool person. I think it was like Carter, like an Iowa seven or something like that. You know. Uh, and, uh, you know, and no, and he had no, no idea that there was this, like, you know, a horrible struggle between the left and the right. And we, we, we kind of thought adults just knew what was going on, you know, and they were doing the best, they were all doing the best thing, you know, and, uh, and the world just kind of, like, you know, ran sensibly. You know, I want to go back to that. That's, that's the politics I want. Is I, I yeah so I, I don't I don't really enjoy watching politics um, you know for the most part I don't know who I'm going to vote for in, in 2024 you know I don't like either guy um, so I'm in that I'm in that 40 percent 40 percent of people there somewhere in your in your uh, data that, that are just like oh, I don't know I keep I keep saying I'm going to vote for that Timothy like the bottom I don't know did you see that or did we talk about that already No I don't think so. So, it's, uh, real quickly, it's the uh, San Antonio Zoo. Obviously, this is a joke, but um, or, or for fun, you know, they're they're uh, running their hippopotamus, whose name is Timothy uh, for President. Now, obviously, it's not a real campaign, uh, but but just they obviously just trying to bring people into the zoo. Yeah, but they have a you know PR campaign, Timothy for President. So it's their hippopotamus, real real hippopotamus, Timothy uh, for President. The slogan is "Nap for Everyone." Um, and, and given, given that I just woke up from a nap, nap, this sounds like a slogan I can get behind. Uh, so uh, I, I half think I'm just going to write in a protest vote, you know, you know Timothy for president. Everybody would be mad at me. Everybody's going to be doing this thing of like, oh, your vote, you know, not voting for my guys, but vote for the other guy. Well, both sides are saying that, so I don't, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll be one of those assholes, okay? So you're undecided. <laughs> what? Why are you undecided? I don't like either guy. I mean, I can, I can, I can think of probably, you know, thinking of like pros and cons, right? You know, I could probably come up with some pros for each guy, but I can also come up with a lot of cons uh, for, you know, each guy if I really sat down and think about it. And so, and then there's some that are like, uh, you know, you just don't know how it's going to, you know, on, on a particular issue, you just don't know how it's going to turn out uh, with either guy. And it's just, um, you know, I, I think, think they're, they're the worst two candidates, candidates um, that I've seen run in my lifetime, um, and this is sort of frustrating at this point. Uh, getting old and cantankerous, and uh, there's a certain sense of, you know, uh, I don't want to be responsible for voting for either of them. <laughs> I don't know, maybe I will in the end. I mean, I, you know, there's still, still months away, and one of these people might convince me. Um, 
you know, I, I voted for Biden before, you know, I historically voted Democrat, you know, more so than Republican. And so maybe I'll eventually, as I've done the last couple cycles, you know, pinch my nose and, and pull, the, pull the lever for Democrats. But, um, you know, but only with a great deal of frustration uh, if that ends up being the case. But I am tempted by this Timothy fellow. I like, I like his platform. Who? Oh, the, yeah, the, the zoo, yeah. <laughs> well, what's your... What's your biggest pro and your biggest con with both Biden and Trump? Oh, jeez. I mean, I, I, I guess, um, I mean, obviously for Trump, the biggest uh, con is that he's nuts. <laughs> you know, as, I don't know. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of negatives. I mean, I think probably with Trump, um, you know, again, everybody's just listening is free to disagree with me on this, you know, so... Uh, but, you know, uh, I, I worry about him pulling out all support for Ukraine. I think it's probably one of the, you know, so I'm, I'm sort of, I, I was raised in the 80s, you know, so uh, watching some small country kick the Russians in the past is, is kind of, you know, tapped into my prejudices in that sense, I suppose. But, um, you know, so I'm sort of worried about him pulling out of that. Well, he, you know, and he basically, I, I think you're right. I think he probably would. I think 100%. Yeah. I'm like, the only thing I can think of is if the Republicans in Congress all grew a backbone. And we're like, yeah. no, look, you can't do this. But like, yeah. is that historically happened with Trump? <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, I, and I think with issues like that, that I mean, the presidential leadership really doesn't matter. You know. Yeah. Um, so so I think without yeah, presidential yeah, leadership, it's going to be a, a tough lift uh, for Congress. But, yeah, but I'm not a political scientist. So you know, what do I know? Um, you know, I mean, I think the pro for him is, of course, like the anti-DEI stuff. I mean, I think you know, that, that's also one of the most complicated things, right? You know, I think he would be good about. You know, at, at least, least pulling, pulling the federal, federal government, government out of DEI, you know, yeah, um, yeah, that kind of stuff. But it's also the sense of like, well, this is where the com complexities come in. It's like, but does that fuel the nuts on the left? Do they get nuttier? You know, is, is they get louder and more influential if they're using him as kind of a you know sounding board you know, to play off of. Well, Kathy uh, Young's yeah, Kathy Young's of that view. She thinks that Trump yeah. losing in 2020 was great in part because. It uh, it did result in this this the left becoming well like normal uh, well not normal but like the, the center left retaking the party basically right right um, I think that's a legitimate, legitimate. I mean I think it's a legitimate, 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 legitimate you know uh, uh, concern, concern but uh, so I don't I don't, know. I don't know I mean of course in Florida you know DeSantis has been in charge for a while now and it actually has been pretty good you know from Florida at least in the sense of tamping down the DEI stuff here um, but of course you know, the Democratic Party of Florida is in complete chaos so. There's not really much opposition you know, to it. And there, there are legitimate you know, complaints about the uh, DeSantis going too far and you know, free speech concerns and things like that, which I you know, resonate with. But, um, you know, with Biden, um, let's see, you know, I think the pros again, I think he's been good internationally. You know, so I think again with Ukraine, with Israel, you know, things like that, I think he's been pretty good. Um, you see, you know, I think that's where he shines. Yeah, um, I think that's where he shines. I think the negative is he, you know, comes. I mean, I, of course, both men are ancient. You know, they're basically walking fossils. You know, so uh, that's kind of a negative for both of them. But um, I think for him, it's kind of the opposite. I mean, they're both the opposite. You know, is that he seems like he's in thrall, you know, to his young progressive staffers. You know, so that like like for instance, the speech he gave at Morehouse College was pretty gross. You know about how racist the U.S. is and this kind of stuff. Um, so uh, that um, it was so Morehouse College is a historically black university and and just you know I mean I would say I don't remember exactly his quotes but he's kind of talking about how the the U.S. continues continues to discriminate against you know the um, black you know young young black people and this kind of stuff and that they're you know their 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 country isn't treating them the way they deserve and blah blah blah. So I think that sort of you know, uh, feeds into narratives about race that really don't seem to be true in um, 2024, but which is kind of like a conspiracy theory on the left uh, to some extent. Uh, you know, he's not been, he's not been, neither, neither of them have been great with free speech, right? You know, so there's that issue. Um, yeah, I, I, I do worry about some of his, like, due process stuff, like with uh, Title IX and universities. Yeah, uh, I disagree with him about perverse. that, too. Yeah. Yeah. So some of that, some of that kind of stuff. I mean, so see, I mean, if you, you know, 
there, anybody can sit down and say, yeah, but this guy would do this, and that's terrible. And I'd be like, yeah, I mean, I sort of agree. That's, that's probably pretty bad, um, you know. I mean, immigration is another one. I, you know, I, I, I think, you know, probably I'd, I'd lean a little bit more towards Trump, you know, than Biden with immigration issues. But, uh, um, you well, know, it's just, it's just... What do you think of him killing the... Killing us solving the problem. Well, that was, that was cynical, obviously. I mean, that, you know. Well, that, but like, that, he's, that. like, he's obviously not better for solving the problem if he's deliberately. Preventing no, I mean, that's fair. Well, there you go. That's my, that's my <laughs> point. See, I, I, like, it's kind of like, well, what about this guy? He's bad. This, yeah, yeah, I get it. I get it. That's this is why I'm like not enthused about, you know. I mean, you contrast this to like in, you know, 2008, 2012. I was, you know, again, maybe you listeners don't like Obama. I liked Obama. I voted for him both times, you know, and I was excited for a variety of reasons. I mean, first, you know, it was kind of cool. It was the first black president. That was pretty awesome. You know, but I was excited about him, the man, too, you know, that he had a very positive message. You know, I don't know that he turned out to be, like, one of the world's best presidents or anything or one of the U.S.'s best presidents. But, you know, he was fine, you know, um, and there, he did a lot of things I agreed with. He did some things I didn't agree with, probably, but... Uh, overall, he was pretty good, um, and so I missed that. You know, I missed that sense of like I'm actually kind of excited about voting for blank person. You know, um, and that wasn't the case with you know Hillary Clinton, who I voted for in 2016, and and uh, yeah, I, I sort of liked Biden in 2020, but I've been a little bit disappointed with how he turned out. Um, so you know, I'm back to the point of not being at, at all excited <laughs> about either guy in 2020, and that's a, a little bit you know. So it feels it feels a lot like 2016. Uh, again, for me, of uh, being asked to choose between two bad candidates, um, and uh, so, but the other, I mean, the other wild card, of course, is you know we don't know who Trump's vice president, you know, would be, you know, and uh, if he were to nominate a fairly moderate person uh, like Tim Scott or something like that, or you know, then uh, I might start thinking like, well, do, do I start playing the game of voting for who's the heartbeat, heartbeat and a cheeseburger away from the presidency, you know, kind of a thing, and. Uh, um, you know, so if someone like Tim Scott were on the ticket, uh, he would probably be of the four, someone I'd be the most excited about, you know, I might kind of go, well, maybe I'll take a chance here, you know, <laughs> that maybe a, a couple more cheeseburgers will kind of move things over, uh, pretty rapidly. We end up with a Scott presidency or, you know, something like that, you know, pretty, but that's, you know, that, that's a gambling vote. Um, uh, and you, you never know. Maybe both these guys will outlive me for all that I know. Uh, so, well, we'll see. So. Politics suck. That's really, that's really, I, you, know, I, you know, I'm not, I don't have strong opinions. I try not to pay a whole hell of a lot more attention than I absolutely need to to politics and, um, uh, other than just finding it all very tiresome right now. So, well, speaking of vice presidents and gambling, uh, President Trump wanted his last vice president to throw out the elect election results so that he can yeah. remain in office mm -hmm. as well as a whole bunch of other illegal activities to remain in power. Does yeah. this not concern you? Of course. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that's the, the main negative of, of, of Trump is, uh, yeah, I don't think he's uh, a fascist or like, you know, like, I, I think he's more like, <laughs> what was this, you know, uh, I, I, he reminds me more, what was it, like Berlusconi was in Italy, like the, the guy who was just, uh, had no real principles at all. But was you know authoritarian in the sense that he wanted to you know suck as much money out of the government as he possibly could you know it was sort of his uh, it was all about himself you know so I think Trump Trump's ideology is just all about Trump you know I don't I don't think he has any real ideological blueprint for being president you know other than to line his own pockets and that kind of stuff so yeah so I mean I think you know the the left has a fair point about you know Trump being authoritarian. Not in a fascist sense, but in kind of like this clumsy, self-centered sense, you know. But on the other hand, I haven't been wild about some of Biden's stuff either. And like I said, doing the, the the lack of due process in Title Nine, you know, the uh, uh, what was it? The uh, I know everybody called it the Ministry of Disinformation, but it was like the well, they walked uh, that back. But yeah, they well, but only because they they came under a lot of complaint and, and you know and pressure. So uh, you know, um, I I don't know that I'm blown away by the the, the uh, egalitarian principles of the Democratic Party. Yes, I mean, I guess, you know, anything's better than Trump, you know, so I, I concede that that point, you know, in terms of, you know, narrative. But, uh, um, you know, I think in general, the trend over, you know, really since 2001 has been, you know, a gradual erosion of um, individual freedoms, um, and not just in the United States, but across the world, really. 
Um, and, uh, you know, and I think both parties have contributed to that in, in, in different ways. You know, Trump is just louder and more selfish about it, you know, and more obvious about it. But, uh, you know, I think the general trend is there on both sides. So, but unfortunately, the libertarians are kind of crazy. Um, so <laughs> otherwise I might be sort of tempted to say, well, libertarianism might be the way to go, but, uh, they're all kind of, you know, nuts. <laughs> I say that affection. I know a lot of libertarians, actually. I think you know, individually they're actually good people, but, you know, the, the politics sometimes comes across a little wacky. Have your politics changed since Gamergate or due to Gamergate? No, not really. I mean, I think, you know, um, like I said, I, I was, you know, an Obama supporter back then. Um, I think to the extent that politics, my politics have changed, I don't think my I don't think my political views have or have changed very much, um, you know, at all. I'm center. I think of myself as center left, um, you know, an Obama progressive, whatever the hell that means by you know today's standards. It's just that you know over the last ten years that we see a lot more extreme voices in both polls, right? You know, getting a lot more attention, a lot more influence, and that's sort of discouraging to you know to see. Uh, it, it was happening you know, earlier than 2014 on the right, you know, and I can remember that, you know, even during Obama's presidency, like, at least by like 2011, 2012, kind of watching the right seem nuttier uh, over time. Um, and at, the, at, at that point, I thought it was great uh, in the sense of like, well, these, these people are getting nuttier, which means they'll never get elected, you know, so I was still pretty Democratic, you know, uh, you know a Democrat voter at that point. And thought, hey, you know, uh, you know, you, you, there were examples of like Republican congressmen who were saying, like, you know, talking about how like women can't get pregnant if they're raped, you know, kind of thing. And it's like, oh, that, that's that nuts. was my okay. state, by the way. That was my state. That's Missouri for you. <laughs> yeah, I still remember. I was like, oh, these people are going down a rabbit hey, hole. We, that's, we, that's... He lost though. Missouri did get rid of him. <laughs> yeah, at that time, I'm saying at that time, it seemed it was it was kind of funny. Not, I mean, I don't think that viewpoint's funny, but you know what I mean. Like, it was just kind of funny to watch like the Republican Party implode, and you know, because I was a Democrat voter at the time, you know, uh, I was like, finally, you know, our party makes sense, and most voters like things that make sense, and uh, this will probably be a long term boon to uh, the Democratic Party, which at the time I thought made sense. Uh, and I didn't agree with everything, but, you know, and I was an independent. I wasn't technically part of the uh, Democratic Party, but, you know, my views tended to align. Uh, I was, kind of, I guess, like a Joe Manchin kind of thing that, you know, sort of uh, generally sort of aligned with those that viewpoint. And then, you know, to my dismay, the, the, the left went crazy. You know, they kind of like followed the path of the right, I guess, you know, but they were behind by maybe five years. Um, but, uh, you know, I watched my, what probably historically would have been, you know, my side, uh, develop in a very similar way. And these like loud, crazy conspiracy theory, anti-American voices on the left started to become more and more, you know, prominent. You know, this idea that like, you know, the U S is permanently stained by racism and colonialism just wasn't a thing 10 years ago. I mean, probably for your younger listeners, it's hard to imagine the idea that you say like the United States is racist would have been absurd in 2014. People would have thought you were crazy if you said that, you know, uh, sort of thing. And now on the left, it's sort of accepted as an absolute truth, you know. And then and now you have people, you know, um, you know, particularly with the Palestinian, you know, Israeli crisis, chanting. You know, I don't think they're the majority of people on the left, but you know, so they're extreme, but just openly chanting fairly anti-Semitic, you know, uh, slogans, and you know, it's just it's just so weird. It's like both sides went down their own rabbit holes, you know, and so to the extent that I don't, I don't think my politics have changed, you know, and that I still probably want the same things, um, you know, that I did 10 years ago. It's just that my confidence in my side, if you will, being able to, you know, constructively move forward on those things has diminished uh, over time. So, um, yeah, that's kind of how things have changed, I guess. Are you okay with gaming sites criticizing games through a political or religious lens, such as a Marxist, feminist, Christian, or other lens? Well, I mean, they have the right to do that, you know, if, if they if, if they want to. Whether whether I'm going to read it or, or not is, a, is is another, you know. So I, I'm not I'm not going to read a Marxist or, or feminist or Christian critique of gays. I could care less, you know, uh, about those uh, those perspectives. But you know, they have they have the right. Um, to publish uh, the, the, those views, uh, I think you know what 
tends to concern me most is not that people are saying these things, uh, but rather that gaming companies take them seriously um, sometimes, you know, uh, that game companies sometimes seem to think that the loudest voices on the internet or in, in games journalism represent some kind of like societal consensus on, on, on an issue, which usually isn't the case. So I wish game companies would take them less seriously. I, w I wish it didn't seem too like everything was condensing into, uh, particularly in games journalism, that like everything was becoming this kind of like quasi-Marxist analysis of video games. It's just so boring uh, after a while to see that same analysis over and over. Like, you know, we need to talk about, you know, the articles will start that way. You know, I mean, like, oh, God, I, I, whatever, whatever that follows a headline that begins, we need to talk about we probably don't need to talk about, you know, is uh, generally my uh, perspective on those things. And so, we need to talk about uh, headlines we don't need to talk about? Yeah, basically. <laughs> or that we need to talk about? Yeah, yeah. Um, so that, that's kind of, you know, I, I think it's tiresome. I, I think they're they're not interesting in perspectives for, for me, um, you know. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I don't know. I guess people re must... It, it must Somebody must read them, I guess. I don't know, but maybe, maybe this is an approach that's focused entirely on like hate clicks. You know that uh, this is all like troll baiting in order to get angry gamers to read the the next. You know, uh, sort of like the I don't know Twitter algorithms that throw rage bait stuff in front of you to get you to click, right? You know, maybe that's the model now for uh, a lot of these uh, these sites. But um, but my impression is, is a lot of them aren't doing that well. You know, in terms of revenue, but you know. Uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe they know what they're doing. I wouldn't write those articles. But... Do you think there can be any value in analyzing games or other works of art through a political lens? Uh, nah. <laughs> I don't think. Uh, I don't know. I I I I, I want to say yes. You know, and I I feel like the the correct answer is yes. Um, but I, uh, at least over, uh, yeah, so I, I guess occasionally I would say sometimes it could be, if it wasn't the norm, uh, I think it could be kind of fun to occasionally see something different that, you know, sort of analyzed, you know, uh, games through set through. But I, I think there's just so much of that r right now that it's just a, a very tiresome way of thinking about, about games. So like the, the everything is political, you know, uh, perspective, right? You know, so let's talk about the, uh, the politics of Angry Birds, you know, kind of stuff. And sometimes it's okay to say like it's just a game. There's no politics in it, you know. Um, uh, and you know the, the the idea that not talking about politics is political. No, sometimes it's just like talk, people just don't want to do it, you know. It's and, and, and uh, so yeah, I, I think occasionally you have to be fine. But um, have I come across an article? in that vein that made me think like, wow, I really need to rethink about games in a different way. No, I've never, never had that experience of reading a political article about games that maybe say, wow, this was really insightful. And I think I understand games better now. You know, it's just more like, all right, I've read three paragraphs and I've wasted a minute and a half of my time. Let me stop now before I waste any more of my time is more of my reaction to it. So no, I don't find those articles particularly helpful. Some people stop say, writing them, please. Stop writing them. <laughs> some people say that Gamergate was the first battle of the culture war. Do you have any thoughts on that framing? Oh, culture war stuff comes and goes. I mean, again, I don't. You know, there, there obviously were, were culture war things happen. I mean, you know, abortion right is culture war, and that's been going on for decades. You know, um, so I don't think it was the first battle but it you know it came in right around the time of you know what otherwise has been called this sort of like great awakening right you know the idea that uh you know, you know prior to this the you know right had gone down its own rabbit hole you know uh had begun to go down its own, own rabbit hole uh and gamergate kind of kicked in and right about the time we started seeing the left go down a rabbit hole you know um as well so yeah, it was sort of timed, you know, to the beginning of the Great Awakening. You know, that's uh, Matt Inglesias' term, uh, by the way. Um, but I don't think it caused it. You know what I mean? Like, you know, and I think there was some stuff brimming around that same time uh, that, in retrospect, you know, might have been something of a of a red flag. You know, I, I remember politically. Um, 
the people talking about this idea that progressives, you know, on the far left were upset that Obama wasn't progressive enough, you know, and that was while well, he was still president. So that was probably around the time of 2014 that, you know, he hadn't moved forward on things like reparations or, you know, or, or whatever else, or, you know, uh, I don't even remember what all the issues were at the time, but, you know. Um, well, I mostly remember them complaining about like, the drone war. Yeah, there's, there was a drone stuff uh, that was going on, um, probably some stuff about integration and that kind of stuff. Uh, so I, you know, I, I think uh, it's yeah, kind he of had criticized for that too. You're right, and then also yeah. that he didn't push hard enough for a public option. Though I, I don't, I think that was more on Congress than him specifically. But yeah, yeah, that, and I'm trying to think what else he was was criticized for. Uh, Wear, uh, wearing a tan suit. You know, <laughs> did John mustard well, on a, on I mean, a burger? That's, you know, that's, that's beyond the the, the, the pale here, you know. So, <laughs> especially if it was after Labor Day, right? You know, kind of thing. I don't know. Um, but uh, I, I think it was kind of like the canary, in, you know, or one canary in a coal mine, uh, to to see, you know, not just maybe some reasonable. Like, like we talked about this before. Like, I, I think some of Anita Sarkeesian's initial critiques of video games actually were kind of interesting. Uh, but you know, but to see it then like go go down a rabbit hole uh, was weird, and that might have been like how intense it got and how stupid it got. Sometimes um, that might have been a sign of things to come, and obviously, it, and obviously, it was kind of a sign of things to come in the sense of like how you know, um, just how like I don't know. I mean, I, I keep I don't know. I keep bringing up Israel Palestine, and I'm not a uh, expert on the Israel Palestine, and I, I think you, you know you, there are probably reasonable critiques of, you know, Israel's approach to the war in Gaza, and you know, I don't like seeing people die, you know, and this kind of stuff, and you know, but you know, the sort of the sense of like, you know, there's a genocide, you know, going on right now, you know, and everybody's like, you know, instead of saying like, hey, look, you know, uh, we want peace in the Middle East, and we're sort of upset that maybe you know Israel is being callous in its approach to you know, uh, fighting Hamas, you know, uh, but also Hamas, you know, is hiding behind some, you know, you can have like a cr critical view uh, of, of that without thinking like, this is a genocide, this is just like, you know, they, the, the, this is just like the Nazis, you know, kind of stuff. And uh, you see these kind of like slogans, that, you know, get repeated, obviously ad nauseum, but, you know, by, and very robotically by some people. On the on the left, and you know that's sort of discouraging. Not that I again, you know, and I, I may agree or disagree. It's not it's not the critique of Israel that's that's discouraging. It's just the obviously stupid way that some people do it um, that is uh, you know discouraging. Uh, you know that's true philosophers. I mean, you can say that about like the Russia stands who think that you know uh, the Ukraine should give up half their territory. You know, to, to, you know, and the war with Putin and, you know, the people that uh, love China or, or Cuba. Yeah, there's a lot of stupidity to go around. Um, so, um, on both sides, you know. Um, so, that, that, that's sort of discouraging to see. But, anyway, that, that's why my argument for this being like a canary in the coal mine sort of scenario. What do you think of the framing of Gamergate or the reaction to it as being a moral panic? Oh yeah, I mean, it would definitely more panic. <laughs> if we're talking about this idea of, if you know, if 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 only if only not for Gamergate, you know, China wouldn't suppress protesters in Hong Kong, you know, kind of a thing, you know. That, well, I haven't that heard that specific thing. one, but they've made no. I'm making that one up. I'm, I'm joking about that one up, but that's my point. It's like you know, if if, if only you know, if only not for Gamergate, we would have been able to resource Swiss cheese from the moon by now, you know, kind of a thing, you know. That sort of narrative that is going on of uh, trying to connect Gamergate to everything else. See, obviously, that's a moral panic. You know, again, it doesn't mean that you can't be critical of Gamergate supporters. You know, or are worried about you know um, abuses towards women. You know, in the games industry or or game game you know, women gamers. Um, but the the way it you know, went off the rails entirely and thinking like you know. Uh, uh, this is just like 1933 Germany, you know, uh, Weimar Republic, and it's all down to Gamergate. You know, that kind of narrative is unhinged, you know, and and when you see, you know, people get, you know, unhinged, um, and particularly when they're just not interested in evidence, you know, they're just not interested in anything that doesn't support that narrative, then that's a pretty good sign you get, you're, you've got a moral panic. So, yeah, no, it, it very clearly was a moral panic, yeah. Well, uh, speaking of the moon, Brianna Wu recently went on Trigonometry uh, yeah. podcast, and she 
apparently says that, quote, people thought the white male gamers were the assholes. Now it's us. And she's referring to various far left oh. groups on Twitter. I, I, she's sane. <laughs> she's actually, I mean, I mean, I occasionally come across her on, on Twitter and she sounds sane. <laughs> she's like an actual sane person on Twitter. Uh, I mean, I, they're, they're, I know she has these, like, these weird fights with like Jesse single and stuff like that that are strange, but you know, uh, but barring some of that stuff, I mean, from what I've seen, you know, like her narrating some stuff like on the, like, like on Israel, Gaza stuff, whatever, like she seems like a, like a rational human being, um, you know, so maybe that's a good sign that we, we have some of these people. That, I think even, uh, I always forget her actual name, but AOC, right? The congresswoman, um, and I'm not going to try to remember what AOC stands for because I can never Alexandria remember. Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. There you go. Thank you. I'm glad one of us could do it. Um, you know, I think she even has some pretty, pretty sane comments. You know, well, she's moderated, about. I think, in in recent years. Yeah. And good for her. No, good for her. She has because she was pretty out there for for a long while. Um, you know, and hopefully that continues uh, and such. So I don't know. May, maybe these are good signs that some of the people that were kind of like initially involved in. I mean, they'll never admit they were wrong. I mean, it's because humans. Well, don't do that. you say but, that. Uh, um, I haven't seen the trigonometry interview, but yeah. in in uh, she was recently heard in Counterpoints, who I know and is possibly going to endorse this project. Disclosure: He said he would okay. endorse it if I do a Kickstarter or a crowdfunding Ooh. campaign. But yeah. they talked with Queeman, and Queeman wanted to grill Brianna because he he feels as though she's lying about some things, uh, yeah. including Total Biscuit, uh, and hurt his reputation and she said recently um in that discussion with queeman she said that um i don't remember the exact quote but it was something along the lines of if i reevaluated um the situation with total biscuit today i might come to yeah. a different conclusion than what i did when i evaluated it at the time so her. Uh, yeah I don't, I don't know but she hasn't changed her view on gamergate yet um specifically just yeah. total biscuits role in it i guess yeah, well, I mean, baby steps, right? You know, that's that's but fair. She, I don't think she's, um, she hasn't like formally apologized to Jenna Bain either, though. She probably should. No, and you know, and I don't, I don't know all the inside baseball. Into the public, all those into too. the game for game. Yeah, and and you know, um, public apologies also are, are are very fraught. You know, even legally, right? They could they could be. So if if you kind of like slant, you know, I, mean, I guess if you kind of smeared someone, you know, then it may be difficult to admit that you're wrong uh legally it, it could be possibly but yeah but on the other hand you know of course in the united states that the the uh grounds for slander are pretty high so you know all she all she probably would need to say is like i said this thing and it turned out it wasn't true and i apologize but i didn't i thought it was true at the time you know and generally speaking as long as you thought it was true it's not slander you know so um but uh, but but there, but there may be some hesitancy, you know, for people to 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 make public apologies, and you know, but I don't know, maybe she will um, at some point. So, oh. but like like I said, I mean, I've been I've been startled by how, and I, I think there are other examples of people that have done that at least of kind of saying like, you know, I was I was wrong in twenty twenty, right? You know that that. Well, Peter you know, Coffin uh, changed his mind on Gamergate too recently, uh, but mm. but he's a communist, so I don't. Uh, you know, which, you know, free speech, uh, you know, he, I've talked with him, I'm friends with people who I disagree with, but um, yeah. I, I disagree with his communist views. I don't think that's like a good progression necessarily. No, 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 it's obviously, <laughs> Listen, pick up a history book, you know, uh, kind of a uh, scenario. But, but he's yeah. willing to talk about it and uh, he's is right on Gamergate now, so I guess that's good. Good, yeah, fantastic. What do you think of the framing of Gamergate is a battle between those who believe in enlightenment liberal values and those who don't. Um, I'm trying to think of which side is which. <laughs> I guess each side would frame themselves as the guardians of liberal values. Well, they wouldn't right? call yeah. themselves liberals, I don't think, on anti-GG, really. Would yeah. They, um, they, well, not on Gazi, at least, right? Because they would call themselves like, like progressive. I guess so. But I, yeah, I, I suppose it depends on... Yeah, I mean, it's it's like a small L, little little L, you know, sort of scenario, I suppose. But uh, um, no, I mean, I think probably most of these like cultural war debates are just a bunch of angry people, right? You know that, um, or it's very tribal, you know, and it's, it's not that they're necessarily good guys and bad guys. That you know, people on one side think that they're the guardians of of the future, and the other people are, are bigoted assholes and. 
the other side thinks the same thing, just in reverse, right? You know, uh, and and the reality is in most of these kind of like culture war debates, you know, kind of the defining element is you know, a lot of people are behaving badly on both on both sides of this stuff. Now, you know, again, my my own sympathies probably at this point, and we talked about this before, are probably have switched a little bit, you know, in the sense that you know at, at this juncture, I, I think the the pro gamer gate, you know, folks were probably closer to being on the right side of this than the anti-Gamergate folks. Um, but, you know, my, my, my guess is, to be sort of generous, is that, you know, the anti-Gamer... Most of the anti-Gamergate people... I mean, some people were probably involved in pretty cynical exercises, but, you know, probably the average person that was, you know, anti-Gamergate, you know, really was concerned about, like, sexism and, you know, in games, and that's a fair thing to worry about, that they may not have engaged in as much critical thinking on the issue as maybe we would hope in retrospect, but, you know, I think they probably were, you know, concerned about, you know, in, in their minds, legitimate issues and things that I probably would agree with, you know, um, as being an important issue, at the very least, uh, and just maybe didn't see it all the way through that, you know, the narrative may not have been um, as accurate uh, as we might have hoped. And, and same thing on the other side. I mean, you know, Gamergate supporters were worried about, you know, the conflicts of interest in games journalism and, you know, uh, and then started to feel like they'd been unfairly smeared uh, because of the actions of a few people. Um, and that's legitimate, too, you know. So, um, you know, the reality is, I think, you know, a lot of these, like, big culture war debates that, you know, is is uh, that I always say this with, like, abortion, right, you know, which is probably one of the most difficult um, debates in the U.S., that you could theoretically take 10 sane people on each side of this and put them in a room like a papal conclave and just stick them in there, you know, give them food and water, and they have to stay in there until they fix this issue, right? You know, maybe it takes them 30 days, maybe it takes them 90 days, who cares? Eventually they have to, like, light up the fireplace and send the smoke up through the chimney to say that they've come to a consensus and they've fixed the abortion issue, you know, forever and ever. And they probably could do it. You probably could do it, right? You know, if, but that's we don't have a scenario where we kind of force people to compromise. It's quite the opposite. We reward people for not compromising, you know. Um, and I think that's kind of the challenge um, right now. I think a lot of these things that we just we think of as intractable really are fixable. It's just that we don't have incentives for people to fix them, you know. So, and then we end up with these two sides that just fight, you know, endlessly. Anything else you want to say about politics before we move on to the next section? Oh, politics are stupid. Um, that's all, I think, you know. It's, they're just so discouraging. If anybody is listening to this and thinking going into politics, you know, try to be sane. Uh, help us, you know, work at compromising with the other side. You know, I don't know. Use data, not emotion, uh, to guide your politics, etc., etc. All right. Interactions with, in this case, both sides. Did you interact with any pro-Gamergate people? What was that like? Um... It, it, I, I more more so more recently. I think at the in twenty fourteen, not not too many. Um, I don't think I, you know most of my exposure to the game politics in twenty fourteen was through uh, through I'm sorry the Gamergate in twenty fourteen was through Game Politics. It was the, the website Game Politics, which if your listeners are younger, they probably don't even know that thing existed. Um, you know, and uh, and I think Game Politics was. Um, fairly centrist on it, but maybe leaned a little bit in the direction of anti-gamer gate, you know. Um, but there were there were people on those forums that would argue on both sides. So, but I think they were pretty reasonable overall uh, on that perspective. But no, I don't. I don't think I came across you know a lot of pro gamer gate people at that time. You know, I was I was I saw like Anita Sarkeesian's video. You know, I, I, you know that yeah, you know, at least some of the folks I was you know, chatting with on game politics were at least mildly anti-Gamergate, I think, at that time. Um, and it's only been more recently, in the last, you know, five years, I think, that, you know, uh, I've come across people like yourself or like, you know, Bragg and Glasgow uh, that were more skeptical of the uh, anti-Gamergate narrative. And, and, and I've, known, I've known other people that have sort of shifted, I think, a little bit. And, you know, I don't want to misrepresent other people's opinions, but I think like Jesse Single is a good example of that I've known him. Supposedly, you know, casually he's changed his mind on Gamergate too, but I haven't seen his podcast episode about it. In fact, I reached out to him yeah. before it aired because um, I figured if he's wanted to revisit the topic, which he claimed he was, yeah. that he would want to talk with me, but he never replied. 
Yeah, I think his uh, at least you know I I I subscribed to his podcast, so I, I heard his his Gamergate um, episode, uh, which was maybe about six months ago or something like that. Um, you know, it's him and Katie Herzog. Um, so Katie would be upset if I keep saying it's his podcast. Um, but um, but I thought it was pretty good. I thought it was good. You know, I thought it was I thought it was reasonable. So he has um, changed his view. I, you know, I, again, I don't want to <laughs> be. I'm not the Jesse Single spokesperson, but but I get the impression that probably you know that he's sort of uh, moved, you know, closer to this idea that maybe everything that was said in 2014 was not the God's honest truth uh, about the whole Gamergate thing. Um, so I, my, my impression, you know, and I'm certainly open to him, you know, telling me that I'm dead ass wrong is that he probably has change his opinion, you know, on that issue. I, I, th- I think he's probably been on a fairly similar trajectory as myself, well, you know, leaning from the anti, a little bit anti-Gamergate into more of like, oh, shit, we really got this wrong. Yeah, <laughs> sort I, of thing. I don't remember all of his articles, um, of course, about Gamergate. I remember him being very opposed to it, though. But he was willing hmm. to talk with people sometimes, occasionally, maybe, yeah. um, on Twitter. Only. He himself is a gamer. I mean, he, he himself plays video games, yeah, so there's less, but, that much going on. But he also, uh, kind of like Brianna Wu, actually, I guess, uh, but they both, these are people, and Peter Coffin, too, like, a lot of these people have been attacked by their own side. And then they realize, oh, shoot, I was defending this psycho crazy stuff that was happening during the Gamergate days, and I was on the wrong side of that. And so, like, now um, now that they're coming after me, I'm going to, like, speak out against it. Like, I, I it, you know, it seems like, because like, he's been under attack because of his trans views are slightly controversial apparently yeah i mean and, and you know but i think that's that's that happens right i mean you're just you know it's uh if you in my view on these things is if you if you gain an ally you know you don't need to necessarily no, I don't. yeah i'm not saying it's bad i want them to change their minds but it's like but it's like well yeah. it's like you change your mind because like you got attacked by the same people who attacked us like i don't know it just seems kind of I, I mean i get i get what you're saying but i think that's it's a little bit frustrating that, it's, but i i understand yeah. it's human we need nature. to make our peace with it but because, because you know in my case i i wasn't attacked by anybody or, or, or anything i don't think i've ever been attacked or by I, I shouldn't say ever. Uh, I, I haven't had those experiences of being like massively canceled online or that kind of stuff, like like Jesse has. Um, mild mobs from time to time, but not not like what he's experienced. And, and you know, so I, I've you know I have changed my views just over you know, gradually over time, just by you know thinking about this over years. Um, but you know, I mean, sometimes that's what happens. I mean, this has happened a lot of like the cancel culture stuff. You had a lot of people that were like, cancel culture is not real. This is in the last four years, right? You know, cancel culture is not real, and if it if it is real, then it's good. And then they get canceled, right? And then like, oh, okay, this, this actually does suck, you know, kind of thing. And you know, yeah, it, it would be nice if you'd, you know, uh, if these people would have seen the problem before it became their problem. But I'm also kind of, you know, um, realistic about the sense of like that's just how people function. That's just that's just human nature. You know, uh, uh, you know, humans are basically selfish. Or, you know, well, I, you know, I, so I think my views have changed on the the cancel culture thing. I think there were there was very much a real phenomenon of a lot of people mm. being pushed outside of like the overtone window for like really stupid reasons because of people wanting power, basically. Um, but I I think that that's like largely gone away, or it's become less prevalent. Um, mm. And like, it's become harder. Think, yeah. but, but it's at the same time, too, like, which is to say, like, people don't, but like, also. Like, what is canceling, right? Because, like, there's a lot of people who do behave unethically who probably should, like, I don't know, like, be canceled, quote-unquote, I guess. Um, who, like, have a hit... But, like, by which I mean, like, if I was a professional individual and I wanted to, like, work in a business relationship... If I wanted to enter a business relationship with somebody, I would want that person to be honest. And, like, if I... If there's evidence that somebody's got, like, a huge history of lies or ethical misdeeds, like, mm-hmm. that probably should be something that's taken into account by society. Yeah, well, but, I mean, like, I think so, I, like, but there's also needs to be like forgiveness too, and like you also have to like have evidence for everything, and like b- mobs of people probably shouldn't make these decisions. It's like individuals who right. should. Yeah. I don't know, but God. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it's it's like a lot of you know these like social constructs, right? Where it's like it's like a thing, right? And it's a thing that happens, but also defining its margins is difficult, right? You know, so you do, I mean, I think you do end up with legitimate questions about like when is when is something a cancellation versus a reasonable you know, societal reaction to some, like, absolutely odious view, right, you know, um, and, uh, you know, and certainly the, the term sometimes is itself weaponized unfairly, right, you know, so, 
Yeah, for instance, you know, we, we might say, in most cases, we ought to have the ability to speak, you know, openly, publicly, and as long as we're speaking on an issue that has nothing to do with our job, then we shouldn't be fired for it, right? You know, so if I work for Chick-fil-A and I say I'm going well, to No, sure, I'm not talking about party. political views. I don't care about politics. Like, I don't, well, that, that I don't want to fire, I don't want to fire people for politics. I don't think that's, like, super yeah. common, though, anymore. I think I think yeah, it no, was common probably, five ten years that. ago with with the crazy the awakening, but I think that that's largely gone away. Yeah. I mean, you still get you still get examples. I mean, there, there certainly are still uh, examples. For instance, in in academia, where you know certain academic papers, you know, people don't like. You know, and it's usually on a, in a, on a sense of topic. Like a lot of it still is on like trans stuff, right? You what's know? the best example and, you can and, think of recently, just so we can go over it? Briefly, um, one one example that in that happened about a year ago that became kind of famous was in a journal uh, called Perspectives on Psychological Science, um, and the the fifty cent version of this was there was one article that had been published um, by um, a black scholar kind of claiming that racism was pervasive in the discipline in, in psychology. Um, and then there were a number of commentaries that were written arguing against that. And I mean, this is, this is some inside baseball here. I mean, the allegation essentially was that the editor of the journal um, had uh, sort of trying to think exactly what, you know, basically that some of the peer review around that was biased, you know, that he basically had sort of stacked the deck in favor of these commentaries that were negative um, about the original paper, you know, saying that there was racism everywhere in the discipline. Um, you know, and, and of course the, the, the people who wrote the commentaries were white, you know, mostly, yeah, so there was this racial dynamic there anyway. And... Um, so the author of the original paper kind of wrote a public blog, uh, you know, basically accusing this editor of some weird editorial practices, which is fair, you know, uh, but also saying that the whole thing was racist, you know, of course, you know, and, uh, and then it ended up becoming this huge brouhaha. So the, the editor was like fired within like a weekend, I think, you know, without being given much of a chance to even state his side of things. You know, my impression was that what he was accused of doing editorially, you know, maybe was not the best, but it was very common, you know, among editors of journals, you know, in terms of how they set up comments and replies and that kind of stuff. Like, I've experienced the same exact thing at that journal under other editors, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, for instance, uh, the sense of it being, you know, sort of stacked, you know, a little bit. Um so and, when you say they stack the it, like, what do you mean specifically? Like, what is the specific so sort of like, allegation? So sort of like you write an article. Let's say I write an article saying, like, video games really aren't that bad. You know, for instance, they don't cause aggression. And then the editor solicits, like, five commentaries that all all disagree with me. You know, instead of soliciting, like, maybe two that disagree with me and two that do agree with me, and maybe one that's not sure, or that kind of stuff. So... So it feels like a pylon, I think, a little bit that, like, you know, all all the commentaries are sort of negative, you know, uh, towards my article, you know, sort of thing. And it's not pleasant. It's not fun, you know. To, well, is it to... that they they just happen to disagree, or is it that they picked them because they disagree? Well, I think that was that was the allegation. That's the allegation. Okay. But you don't that you think that's true? So you. Um, well, I, and I, I think part of the allegation too, and I'm trying to remember the details, and I want, you know, because, and I'm, my memory is very poor. As we, uh, so this is guy uh, um, Lee Justin is probably the, the the person to to reach out to to get a really good account. He's actually blogged about this, so look up his Substack. He's written about this. He was one of the common common uh, commenting uh, authors. Uh, so obviously he has. Uh, you know, have a very passionate perspective. <laughs> I wasn't involved in this at all, by the way, for the record. Uh, you know, um, but he, but, you know, but but some of the accusations, but they're also with these accusations of racism. They're basically that, like, so I think like Justin had, in his comment, had made this allegate, this, uh, or this allegory or whatever, this allusion to uh, uh, Fiddler on the Roof, the play or musical, I've never seen it, uh, where they talk about this idea of, um, you know, you sold me a horse, but then you gave me a donkey, you know, kind of thing. And so his, his idea was like, you're, you're, you're selling people science, but you're giving them ideology. That was kind of like the point he was trying to make. 
But the original author, whose name was last name was Roberts, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, was like, "Aha! Horses and donkeys. That's racist. You're saying black people are donkeys or something like that." Like. Which was really kind of a tendacious allegation to you know uh, to make you know so so there there were these kind of like you know I, I think pretty spurious allegations of racism um, you know in, in in this sort of back and forth exchange but the, but the point point being is that one you know this editor got like summarily fired I mean he ne he never had much of a chance to even comment and and you know talk about his rationale why you know maybe what he did wasn't perfect I'm not saying what he did was perfect but what I am saying is, if it was imperfect, it was very common. Like we we would be out of editors if you, if you really like held this standard to all editors of all journals in psychology. Um, and also for a while, it look people were like trying to get these pay, these comments unpublished. They had been accepted, you know. They they had been you know, accepted for publication, so people were trying to get these comments, you know, essentially censored, you know. And that was it was bad. Now, fortunately, finally after a year, they actually did. You know, so so they got rid of the editor. The journal actually largely shut down for a year. It didn't accept papers. Didn't have an editor. Um, and uh, they, but they finally the organization that that runs them, which is the uh, Association for Psychological Science, they actually did finally decide to publish all of the commentaries. And and I think Roberts had a response to them as as, as well. Uh, but for a while there, we weren't. No, nobody knew if they were even going to publish these papers, which would have been, you know, censorship. So, uh, so there's good news in the end that they did publish. You know, I'm glad that they did. Um, but, uh, but the whole scenario was just. You know, and you know, most of this was in response to a Twitter mob, by the way. So this wasn't in response to Roberts writing this article. It was, you know, hundreds or thousands of people on Twitter over a weekend being outraged about what Roberts claimed had happened. Um, and again, people were like, this is racist. This is, you know, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, and it turns out the only, you know, real accusation of racism was over this mule donkey thing, which is a quote from Fiddler on the Roof. And if you read it in context, he's obviously talking about, you know, good research versus garbage, you know, essentially. It had nothing to do with black people. Uh, or anything of that sort. So, so we've had like a lot of stuff like that. Papers getting retracted because they, you know, um, don't support a narrative. Whether that's on like feminism or trans issues or um, you know that 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 kind of stuff. Um, so it's, it still happens. It's, it still it still happens. Um, you know, but but I do agree with you. On the other hand, that it's probably less less power behind it than four, four years ago. You know, um, but. Uh, but I do still think it, it, it occurs to some extent. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think that, I mean, I, I think anytime you have people, especially on the internet, uh, I think you're always going to have some people who definitely engage in, like, I guess you'd call it like a, a harassment campaign or like a cancel campaign. I just think yeah. it has, like, less power, I guess that's what I would say, than it used to. And then, by the way, people do want to look up that with the thing I was telling them about. The, uh, the editor who got fired, his name was Fiedler. He was German. Um, and so now people sometimes talk about this as the Fiedler on the Roof episode. Uh, basically, so, <laughs> uh, so anyway, look, look it up, uh, Lee Jessam has a lot of really good, uh, blog posts on this, now granted, he's on, he's very clearly on one side of this thing, so take it, you know, that with consideration, but he writes very well, and, you know, and he, uh, he's pretty good summaries of everything that happened, uh, and it just made us look, as a, as a discipline, it made us look terrible, you know, and it certainly made the Association for Psychological Science look terrible, um, in their initial snap decision to, Fire Fiedler. Um, now again, maybe you know, with a reasonable, extensive investigation, they might have concluded that removing him as editor was the right thing. But that's not what they did. They fired him over a weekend, you know, um, and never gave him a chance to respond to the allegations, which is bad. You know, so, did you interact with any anti-Gamergate people? What was that like? Uh, again, I think, and I can't remember the the people's name. And uh, I would say, you know, in terms of like, you know, like Brianna Wu, no, or you know, Anita Sarkeesian, no, not not anybody that's like really really passionate on on that side. Um, you know, I think initially in twenty fourteen, my interactions were mostly with like game scholars who probably leaned pro Sarkeesian, but weren't like you know, staying up nights worrying over it, if that makes sense. You know, sort of like sympathetic to the anti-Gamergate side, but without being nuts, you know, um, about it. Um, 
So kind of in the same vein. Like I said, I was on the site Game Politics a lot, which I really enjoyed. I'm so I'm so sorry they're gone because they were pretty good. Um, you know, and, and I remember there was like one guy who became like the assistant editor or something like that. That I think, generally speaking, was anti gamer gay, but again, in the same sense, you know, of being just sort of worried about harassment of women in game spaces, which is fair, you know, uh, and that kind of stuff, and largely being persuaded by Anita Sarkeesian. Um, and I, I know, kind of like for the, the circles that I was in, you know, Anita Sarkeesian. Um, was probably more influential than Brianna Wu or, or like Lee Alexander or, or um, God, I'm, for, I'm forgetting the woman whose name really started everything. Um, but it uh, doesn't matter. Um, but, um, and again, I think at that time, Sarkeesian sounded sane uh, anyway, um, whether you agree with her or not, you know. Um, and and I think, you know, over, over the intervening years i had casual exchanges with other game scholars who were more in that marxist vein that you were kind of referring to you know or whatever and realized how really crazy some people were <laughs> on, on this issue and i think that was also what started make me because that's when i started hearing the sort of narrative of like you know oh well you know there's a direct connection between Gamergate and Donald Trump, and I kind of go, uh, huh? Um, you know, um, and I think that was part of what started turning me off to some of that side, um, which is, you know, I guess is a lesson for everybody, whether you're on the right or the left, is you know, by being too passionate, uh, you know, with your views of something, you actually can turn people, or you can unconvince people. You know of your side of things um and so I, i'm certainly an example of that as someone who became unconvinced of the the value of a particular worldview because of seeing just how down the rabbit hole some folks have become with that so yeah i had a little bit i probably had a little bit more interaction but i, I think most of the people initially i was interacting with were not the most radical anti-gamer gay people how could the game? How could the Gamergate conversation have been more productive? Yeah, that's a that's a great conversation. Well, I mean, I think I think what happened is there was sort of a sleight of hand, uh, in the sense that what initially started off as a you know sort of credibility of games journalism discussion, was swapped out for a. Uh, harassment of women conversation, you know, and I, and I think both conversations are worth having. Um, but I, I think it could have been fine to say that there really are these two conversations rather than saying, well, because we're having the women harassment conversation, we can no longer have the games journalism conversation, which is exactly what happened. And I, th I think people could have been savvier about that sleight of hand Obviously, games journalists themselves had a conflict of interest there in promoting it, and then that did end up moving into you know bigger newspapers that were not just games you know journalists um, that were that sort of repeated that narrative. So I think people could have been a bit smarter about you know just not letting that swap happen and having like two thoughts in their head at the same time a little bit, and have been more data based in you know these 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 arguments you know kind of more thoughtful. Understanding that issues can be complicated and nuanced, that you don't have to take the, you know, you don't have to man the ramparts, right? You know, you don't have to take the most extreme version of a narrative and defend it against all data, uh, basically, which I think is exactly, you know, what had happened. But, but I, I think, you know, honestly, I, I think obviously the pro gamer gate people lost control of the narrative entirely, you know, and, and, and uh, at that point, there probably wasn't much that they could do. Uh, other than hunker down and wait, you know, <laughs> and I think that we're ten, 10 years later, we got to that point where people are trying to go like, well, maybe the pro gamer gate people weren't all that wrong. It turns out, you know, so it took, took a decade, but uh, here we are. Um, so I think, you know, it, it was really the sort of objective outsiders who could have put the brakes on things and, and didn't. Right. You know, so, you know, big papers that covered it, like the New York Times, um, you know, Maybe some of us who are game scholars could have been more outspoken about, you know, saying this is a more complicated, nuanced issue than it was being presented as, um, but we didn't, um, you know, and, and, and all of that. Um, so there were no breaks on it, basically, you know, and, and again, I think that happens with a lot of these, you know, big uh, culture war issues is nobody puts the brakes 
uh, on these debates and keeps them reasonable. So, do you have any thoughts on not your shield? Oh God! Um, remind me that, that 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 slogan has come up in so many places. So, not your shield is what was that? Uh, let me see if I remember correctly. Was, was so that Gamergate supporters? Like, uh, Gamergate yeah. supporters, um, I guess in theory, like it was kind of its own thing in theory, I guess, to some yeah. extent. But uh, there were plenty of women that were on their side. A lot of women, a lot of women right. in minorities who supported Gamergate felt as though they were being used as a shield. I've actually interviewed the second person uh, who ever used the hashtag uh, Bashfluff. Mm. I've interviewed him, and I've also talked with Nino, the person, him and Jason Miller, their friends. They, they're the ones who came up with the idea, actually. And oh. uh, I've talked with them, but they... Nino agreed to do an interview, but he's been super slow and actually filling it out, so I don't think it's going to happen uh, in reality. But, uh, yeah, I've talked with them. They basically, they, they wanted to, they felt like they were being used by the games press and by people yeah. who wanted to smear Gamergate. Um, who wanted oh, to say, like, oh, yeah. they hate women, they hate minorities, they're homophobic, they're transphobic, blah, 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 whatever, right? They thought that was all mm -hmm. wrong, of course, because they themselves were these things, and they uh, they wanted to speak out. And they used that on yeah. well, I, th I think by the time you got into like the third or fourth level of people, like you know, like uh, we're good, you're bad. No, you're you're bad, we're good. And they, like a third group was like, "Well, hold on a second, don't get us involved. We're on this side." And then a fourth group was like, "Nah." You know, once you get like, I think at that point, that that's the, that should be the red flag. Like, oh, wait a minute, <laughs> hold on, let's all stop. <laughs> There's okay, people are are. Uh, uh, out over their skis at this point. We need to dial this this conversation back, you know, at some point. Um, you know, so that, that might have been a red flag that maybe things had gotten out of control. Uh, just just like, you know, I, again, I, I keep referencing, like, all these, like, Israeli-Palestine stuff, and I'm really not as obsessed with that as I sound like I am. But, um, you know, when you start having, like, the, you know, uh, Jews for Hamas, you know, kind of stuff, or, like, queers for Palestine or whatever. So like, oh, oh! Okay, stop, stop, stop! Everybody, stop! Let's uh, let's dial it back. We've gotten out of control here. You know, it's not to say one size right or one size wrong, uh, but the conversation is no longer productive. Um, you know, we we need to everybody calm down. I know it's a big deal. I, I'm not saying it's not a big deal, um, but we need to get some level heads in here. You know, and and try to talk about this like adults. And and, and you know, and that's not a criticism of, of not your shield, by the way. It's it's just you know saying that you know probably by that point we start seeing these hashtags going back and forth all over um that it, that might have been a sign that the conversation was no longer a productive one it's not to say that the not your shield people are responsible for it not being productive but rather that you know there's just so many layers of the onion at this point that it's just become convoluted and we need to like dial back and try to figure out more objectively what's going on if that makes sense well, <clears throat> it did change at least one person's mind. Uh, Amanda Maroon, yeah. who I've interviewed, says he changed his mind on Gamergate because of Not Your Shield. Okay. Oh, fair enough. So you mentioned the Queers for Palestine thing. Um, mm -hmm. One of my friends, actually, uh, is tweeted something out recently. Uh, I'm not going to say who it was, because I'm not going to put them bl yeah, blast necessarily. Not. But they they seem somewhat sympathetic to this idea. Um I, obviously, Hamas is a homophobic organization, to say the least. Sure. That's my perception of events. They didn't; they're not pro Hamas necessarily. They just tweeted out that, like, "Oh, uh, I'm a queer person for Palestine," or like, "Queers should support Palestine." Which I, mm -hmm. what do you, what is your reasoning for why that's wrong? If you want to discuss that, if you think they're incorrect. Well, I mean, if you if you try to live in Palestine, or that they should you're support, yeah, and get murdered, <laughs> that's pretty pretty straightforward. Yeah, I mean, I I think it's one of these things that again, we can have like two thoughts in our head at the same at the same time. That you know, um, that the conflict in Israel Palestine is very complicated, right? You know, and that both the Israelis and the Palestinians may have fair perspectives on things, and that they're not neither side is necessarily handling it very well. Um, and, you know, at, at the same point, it's okay to say that we are upset by seeing civilians die in Gaza. That's fine. I, I, am, I don't like seeing it, you know. And also understand that Hamas aside, uh, you know, attitudes towards gay people in that part of the world are not great. You know, um, Except for an Israel, and, strange. You know? 
<laughs> yeah, there's been Israel saying that. Yeah, it's, it's true. And well, well yeah, I don't know think, about like Rojava. They, maybe they're okay. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, you know, it's it's you know you you, you can critique you know other societies. It's okay to do that, you know. Um, and and I think you know progressives, particularly with you know Islam, have been really um, reluctant to identify legitimate concerns you know i mean i'm not trying to pick on islam because you can pick on conservative christianity uh, there's a lot of anti you know gay anti-trans you know views in conservative christianity and it's fair to critique that and it should be fair to critique the fact that that exists in you know parts of the muslim world you know um as well you know and maybe it's even more common in parts of the muslim world you know um, and it doesn't mean that we have to like hate Muslims, you know, or that sort of stuff. It's just that, you know, there are values, uh, in some parts of the world that we are worried about and that, and that's okay. You know, so, it, it, you know, and, and of course that's the, the slogan just, you know, it's just ripe for, you know, like comedy, right. In, in, in a way, because of, you know, in, in parts of that world, including in Palestine and Gaza, um, you can get you know, arrested, um, or executed if you're gay, you know, um, and we should be honest and realistic about that. Uh, and it's not just Hamas, you know, that is, you know, that happens in Iran, it happens in Saudi Arabia, it happens in other parts of the world around, uh, around, you know, um, the Middle East. Um, and, uh, so it just feels naive unless you can tell this larger story of like, look, you know, we're gay, we understand there's a lot of homophobia there. We wouldn't want to live there. We do think that society needs that that society needs to you know think more about gay rights, you know, and this kind of stuff. And at the same time, we don't like seeing kids die, you know, or, or right. whatever else. Yeah. Right. Or they they um, might say that well, people. One of the arguments that people use to support Israel a lot is well, Israel's like a liberal Western liberal democracy, which I think is like a very good argument actually. Um, but like part mm. of this too is that well, Israel. I mean, obviously, there are some homophobic people who live there, like any country. But sure. by and large, they're a very progressive society in that sense. Mm -hmm. Like, they don't care if you're gay for the most part. And so people will say, well, look, you're you're using that, to, to, the fact that they're pro-gay to distract away from the West Bank settlements or the genocide in Gaza uh, or whatever, right? And they don't want to they, – they feel like they're being used as a shield, right? I guess you could say in some sense. Yeah, I, 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 again, that, that just brings me back to this point of like, it's, it's time to everybody stop. <laughs> you know, what I mean, we're, we're starting to talk about like pink washing. Yeah, I think it's kind of the term that gets used in here, right? You know, uh, of Israel, or whatever. It's like, okay, you know, and if you start saying like, you see all these slogans of like, you know, I don't know, uh, Palestinian rights are gay rights, you know, or climate change is a Palestinian freedom issue, blah, 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 blah. Like, ah, no, no, stop, stop. It's, this issue can be its own issue. It doesn't have to be interwoven with every other issue that progressives are worried about, kind of thing. You know, and at that point, I, again, I think it's time that you know, what, once you've started like gluing yourself to roads or you know, s smashing into college, you know, buildings, and and the, and then asking for the college to bring you your your food, or whatever, it's time to stop. Everybody's gone off the rails. Uh, if you if you're chanting from the river to the sea and you can't name the river or the sea. Um, then it might be time to dial back a little bit and, and, and reconsider. Again, I'm not saying that it means Israel's right and the Palestinians are wrong or vice versa. It's just that this, this has become unhinged. <laughs> we're, we're the, the whole dialogue is unhinged. Um, and it's time to dial back and, and calm down, you know, and, uh, and reassess, you know, and try to think about, what maybe we can do to resolve the conflict so neither Israelis nor, nor Palestinians are dying, and and I think that's gotten lost in a lot of this conver you know this, this conversation. That's why I mean I know Biden you know we've been picking on Biden and Trump you know I think Biden has you know, proposed this peace deal again. I'm not a political scientist. It sort of sounds like it's promising. Uh, I hope both sides you know figure out some way to you know to make things work. Um, again, I say that naively because I'm not a political scientist, but, um, you know, so I'm, I'm, you know, there again, it's nice to see at least a few people are trying to figure out some kind of solution here. Uh, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't work, uh, but we need more of that and less, you know, I don't know, 
screaming at like black janitors, you know, uh, when they're in the wrong college building that you're trying to occupy. Because apparently, it's okay to scream at black people again. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that whole thing. It's like I, I saw there was a controversy a few years ago, uh, but I don't not, not recently with the protests. Yeah. I got two questions left, but I know you got to go in seven minutes. So yeah. Okay. So discussion of Gamergate was widely censored online. Why do you think that was? Um, I don't was it was it censored really, or was it just? I think it was just it was more like the loudest voices just overwhelmed. Um, well, it, you know, it was. I mean, it was censored on like 4chan. It was censored on uh, R Gaming. It was censored on NeoGAF. Yeah. It was censored on uh, RPG.net. Mm. GOG. After several years, they allowed the discussion for several years on GOG. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah. There. I get your point. I get your point. Yeah, no, and, I, and I think you're right. I mean, I've seen that in other other contexts too, where yeah, you see like different forums are like, we're just not even going to discuss this. MZ censored you know? it actually too after yeah. allowing it for I, several I, first of the time. Yeah, I know it's something. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to think of like, uh, was it Ian World is like for like uh, Dungeons and Dragons role playing stuff. I think that there are certain conversations they just just won't talk about like the orcs are racist thing, right? You know, kind of stuff. I think there's some examples like that. Um, you know, so yeah, I mean, they're, they're, the, you know, whoever is running these boards or the moderators or whatever are just taking a very moral stance, um, on something, you know, they're, they're private entities, so they have the right to do whatever they want. It's not, you know, what I value in terms of like, you know, I think most dialogues should be pretty open and that kind of stuff. I, I think probably part of their, I mean, they probably have several motives that go into that. One is probably they think that certain conversations are just not constructive. And tend to just like devolve into um, chaos and you know uh, ad hominem and bullying and that kind of stuff, which I think sometimes is is a legitimate concern. Um, I think also you know sometimes the moderators of these places take very moralistic stances, you know, so they're you know basically like you know. You know, hashtag me too, you know, kind of thing. And uh, they refuse to even entertain any, you know, different views, uh, you know, from their own. And I think that may be part of their marketing. You know, I think, and again, in 2020, I think a lot of these places, and 2014 too, you know, uh, over the last 10 years, a lot of these places thought that it was beneficial for them to take strong moral stances on things. Um, particularly strong progressive moral stances on things, and I, I think only now are they starting to realize that wasn't maybe as profitable as they thought it was, and makes them look kind of ridiculous. Um, uh, so I think that they're kind of some of the things that are probably going on, uh, you know, with with them. But uh, but it's tricky, right? Because then they'll just say, "Well, why don't you just create your own spaces?" And then the second you do, then they try to shut them down, <laughs> right? You know, so uh, that's always kind of a tricky thing uh, too. So yeah, I mean, it's, I guess it's what you would call de facto censorship, right? It's not de jure censorship. The government's not doing it, uh, but the uh, you know the community itself is trying to shut down debate on things that it doesn't want to debate, right? You know, which is unfortunate. Cause I actually find that a very weak stance, right? If you're just saying, "Well, we can't talk about this." You know, sort of thing that makes me think like it sounds like you're not really sure that your position is the evidence-based one um you know necessarily but yeah what's right. your what's your last question yeah so paul jossen and stephen mallory of the alt f4 conference are meeting with me next week to discuss oh. concerns that have been expressed by myself and many others including yourself uh about their upcoming conference that so far um has been entirely one-sided. They want to yeah. address these concerns and they want to meet with members of the public, such as myself, uh, okay. to try and, and instill people's confidence, I suppose, in this okay. situation. Now, well, do you have anything, one, you want me to ask them, and two, do you have any message for them before we meet? Um, I mean, I'm happy to talk to them if they want to talk to me. You know, uh, and so uh, I'm actually, su I mean, I'm surprised, but pleasantly surprised. You know, I think when we talked before, I was pretty cynical. Um, so, um, you know, uh, and maybe pretty negative. So first I'm, I'm impressed, you know, so, so good, good job. I, I think I probably said, nah, you, you're never going to get anywhere. So I'm actually, you know, I was wrong <laughs> and you got somewhere. So good for you for, uh, sticking with it. I'm really pleased to hear about this, but, but also good for them. I mean, assuming this is a sincere effort on their part to sort of balance things out. I think that sounds great. 
um, you know, that sounds, that sounds wonderful, you know, so I hope that these talks are productive and I hope they lead to something that is, you know, is benefit. And, you know, so I'll, 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 I'll end this last question by, by saying publicly, I was wrong. <laughs> Tuesday, Tuesday, we'll see if it happens. I, I think it's going to happen. I think it's going to happen. No, they only want to go for one wrong. hour. I'm pleased to be wrong. Yeah. So but go ahead. They only want to go for one hour though. Is a little bit concerning. Oh, to talk to you for one hour? Yeah, but I'm, you know, these are busy people. I understand, but yeah, that's fine. I, but, I think that's. I mean, hopefully, it's part of a longer conversation, whether it's the email or something, whatever, you know. No, but if they want to reach out to me, I'm happy to talk to them too. You know, so yeah, I'm, I'm surprised they haven't already. Um, I have not, not that I've seen. Yeah. Oh well, hey, anything else you want to talk about? No, oh, we get we get two two whole minutes. What can we do with two whole minutes? Yeah. Well, hey, um, so next. I know you said you're kind of you're getting a little bit tired of the interviews, um, but we still have the <laughs> harassment. So many, I have so many good thoughts. <laughs> we have the harassment slash sexism section next. Then we have okay. the media coverage of Gamergate. I think it would be useful for us to discuss the Washington Post and New York Times articles. Okay. Um, if you, you, you feel like you have time to read them. Yeah, yeah. And then we also have light items, uh, which is very short. That's only three questions for neutrals. This and wasn't then, light. <laughs> talking about israel palestine that wasn't light conversation <laughs> no no i guess not uh Abortion, then we have reflections, <laughs> reflections on, on everything that happened uh and then we have closing questions so cool. we probably have at least one or two more full interviews okay. to do if that works for you yeah we could probably do that that'd be fine okay all right well hey Sounds good. have a good night enjoy your D. all right it was fun as always cool. i'll change the thumbnail since we didn't get to like half the topics all right, sounds good. <laughs> All right, All right I'll, I'll go ahead and raid somebody. You take care. Uh, you can stick around for a second if you want to raid. I don't know if you care about that. We'll raid. Right. We'll raid Wick. So he's watching. Oh, he's moderating a debate uh, between Rob Nor and Alex. I don't know who Alex is. So cool. Well, hey, go watch. Right. Uh, go watch Wick and uh, tell him Tachyon sent you. Have a good night, everybody.